You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number four. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's episode is supported by The Wool Room. The Wool Room is dedicated to delivering you a better night's sleep. At thewoolroom.com you can choose from a wide range of mattresses, mattress protectors, bedding and beds filled with British wool, ensuring that you stay cool and comfortable at night. Find out how wool can improve your sleep by visiting thewoolroom.com and claim your 10% discount with the promo code WOOLACADEMY. Today our guest on the show is Peter Ackroyd. Peter is the Global Strategic Advisor for the Woolmark Company in Australia and also the Chief Operating Officer of the Campaign for Wool. I know Peter personally from my time at the International Wool Textile Organization where Peter was elected as President in May 2011. Peter is specialized in world markets for woolen and worsted yarn and fabrics and he has a particular expertise in marketing in Europe, the Middle East, Japan, Korea and China along with in-depth knowledge of the menswear supply chain from farm to fashion. He also serves as the vice president of the strategic board of Premier Vision in Paris. Hello Peter, great to have you uh, on our show. Uh, hello Lisa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Well, I, you have a very uh, exciting biography and um, we always say that you wear a lot of hats in the industry, which makes you so special. And maybe just give us a little bit more background of how you started in the wool industry and a little bit more about your career. I suppose I come from uh, four generations of people in the wool trade. Um, it goes back to my great, 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 great grandfather who in the mid 19th century, I believe, was a coma of wool. Uh, in those days, all the wool, of course, I've got, I've got to say, I was born in Bradford, uh, which is in the north of England, and um, there were at least 70,000 people working in this city of Bradford at the turn of the uh, 19th and 20th century, and indeed, for many years, all the Australian wool came here, so it's in the blood. My father was a, a hand-knitting yarn spinner, a brand called Wendy Wools, which uh, did rather well in the 1970s and 80s, and of course it's still going now, and there's been a great revival of hand knitting, which uh, pleases me no end, but of course father's been dead many years. Uh, so it's in the blood, I suppose. Um, I started in 1974. Um, quite coincidentally, I was studying textiles and Italian language in Bradford, and um, I'd already spoken French, having done my textile studies in France in Lille, Roubaix, and Tourcoing. Um, and... Uh, an organization asked me to show the buyers of Yves Saint Laurent around the British mills. And uh, it was a time when um, Biedermann, a huge French company uh, in Poitou du Nord, north of Paris, had taken on the license for Yves Saint Laurent. It was in those wonderful days when all the, the names of the perfumes became names of suits, jackets and trousers hanging in upmarket stores across Europe. Licensing of Saint Laurent, Pierre Cardin, Pierre Balmain. All those companies um, were, uh, were licensed. That was the heyday of French, uh, of French menswear manufacturing. So that, that's, that's where I started, 1974. Wow. 42 years ago. Yeah. And you have been in wool ever since, haven't you? Ever since, yeah. <laughs> well, and I also know that in one of your career stages, you have lived actually in Baghdad, representing, if I'm correct, the British wool industry. That Can you very, tell us a little bit about that adventure? Very interesting, uh, interesting chapter in one's life. It was in the late 1970s, and um, for some reason, um, Britain and France had restored diplomatic relations with the Iraqi regime, um, and trade started to flow. Oil was at its highest level, um, and OPEC seemed to rule the roost in those days. So the Iraqis were very oil rich, uh, and of course, united under a dictator called Saddam Hussein. So there was no internal strife at all. Uh, all that was put under, all, all, all that was contained by the by the regime, and they were seeking to uh, fill the state enterprise stores with good consumer goods, and they sent a delegation to Yorkshire to buy British worsteds, and uh, that ended up in me spending periods of three months per year, but two to three years uh, in Baghdad, um, looking after the 
importing of UK fabrics and the distribution of them to Iraqi stores, which was a group of uh, state-owned companies across the nation. Um, the Iraqis quite like, well, they very much like British things. Remember that Iraq was under the UK mandate or the British mandate after the First World War. Iraq, Palestine and Jordan came under the British domain. Of course, uh, Lebanon and Syria came under the French domain. Um, so there was a lot of British tradition there and uh, good, well-dressed Iraqis, and they are very well-dressed normally, wanted to buy British fabrics. So Saddam Hussein's companies, uh, state-owned companies, had to provide it for them. Very interesting. One thing I will say about the Iraqis, they paid on the dot. Everything, every letter of credit was paid and processed by the, by the Rafidane Bank, as it was called then, uh, the State Bank of Iraq in London. Wow. Interesting okay. days. I, and I would say that in the, the difficult days of the early 80s, it probably saved half a dozen mills from, from extinction. Mm. So it's, a, it's an interesting quirk of history. Wow, yeah, that's wonderful that you share that with us. Thank you so much. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you are also the chief operating officer of the campaign for wool, and you were actually also part when right from the start of when the campaign started, um, and it was His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales who came up with the idea, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe tell us a little bit about how this campaign started. It started quite quite coincidentally with a meeting with the man called Frank Langrish, who was the president or sorry, the chairman of the British War Marketing Board. And he was telling me a story about how the Prince of Wales had had a mutton renaissance campaign, start people eating more mutton and probably not and probably less lamb. Uh, that campaign had worked and he said that well the Prince wanted to do some work now on the wool industry where it came from a very British base. You know, the Prince of Wales thought or knew that his um His flocks of sheep, particularly herdwicks in the English Lake District, uh, it wasn't worth shearing them. It cost more to shear the sheep than the farmer could get for the wool. So he thought it's time something should be done. Um, so we started the campaign for wool. I mean, in the early stages, um, it was a bit like selling Sauvignon Blanc to the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't want to listen. Um, but eventually, uh, sense prevailed, and the uh, campaign started in the UK, was immediately supported by the Australians, by the, New, by, by the New Zealanders, and eventually by the South Africans. It took um, a visit of Prince Charles to Cape Town to um, cement the deal with the South Africans by, the, by Cape Wools. But in some ways, the, the, uh, the rest is history. We're now six years on. It started in January 2010. It was launched um, in Cambridgeshire. And it's attracted a thousand retailers um, who actively promote the... Uh, environmental aspects of wool, the environmental credentials of wool um, across the globe. It's been a, a very successful campaign. And in some ways, the price of wool r reflects that success. Although I will add that times of recession, I think people tend to buy more carefully, uh, more cleverly. And they tend to make decisions about investment rather than throw away. And this is good because we see wool as the antidote to, to, uh, to fast fashion. And we obviously for many years have been promoting the fact that if you buy wool it is an investment with a return on capital yeah and you as you mentioned just that uh, you do see that the campaign for wool has benefited um, an increase in price for the farmer and you will well remember that we had many discussions within the wool industry um, where there was a debate on the one hand we do want wool prices for the farmers to be high to ensure that they stay in the business. But at the same time, we have processors who want better margins and therefore lower wool prices. And then there's also undecided opinions if the consumers are willing to pay such high prices for wool. And I would be really interested to hear your take on this debate. It's a very interesting question, has been an interesting question for generations. I think if you were to emphasize the fact that buying wool has a return on capital, is an investment, then I think you can win the argument. I don't think you win the argument purely on appealing to, to, to consumers' environmental instincts or the, 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 their love of nature. I don't think that will work. But I think if you, if you uh, talk about an investment with a return on capital, then I think wool has a very good chance. Um, it's a difficult argument. It's not easy. Um, the temptations of buying things which are 40%, 50% cheaper because they're laced with polyester uh, is very tempting. But if you do blend too much wool too much, you do 
destroy the environmental effects of wool or the environmental attributes of wool to, to be to be more accurate. So do you think there's more chance for wool in a premium market compared to a mass market or where do you see it going in long term? I think strategically wool has to be seen to be in the premium market and by seen I mean the premium labels have to demonstrate that they are using wool and the wool promotion organizations have to seize that opportunity to benefit from it. Um, the old marketing term is trickle down and one hopes that if the premium end of the market is using wool and talking about the environmental advantages of wool, their investment with the return on capital that goes with wool, then the segment below in the market will in some ways um, in some ways, um, try to imitate what is happening at the top end. There is evidence of this that certain middle market retailers are currently trying to use what they call fiber upgrade. Uh, to increase or to um, improve the quality of their offer. And um, several UK companies and German companies, indeed, have been doing this. So we see wool as a way to upgrade. Um, in the current retail scene, you will find that the middle market is being squeezed, being squeezed by the very cheap companies at the very bottom end of the market, and to a certain extent by the premium companies at the top end of the market. And the middle market, see, the only way out of this problem is to upgrade and to be seen to be more upper middle than middle middle. And wool can be a solution to get out of the middle middle. That's Wool, what I absolutely. Yeah. A fiber upgrade. Okay. Great. Thank you. And um, also, while we're recording this, you are actually preparing the next campaign for wool e event where you will be meeting in Dumfries House in Scotland. Uh, tell us a little bit about the event and what the goals are. What is exactly happening there? The Prince of Wales calls it the Davos of Wool. He thought that now it's the campaign is six years on, it's time to get the wool community together to discuss how they see the future and how they take the campaign forward. Um, a lot of the emphasis of in, in Dumfries House, which is a beautiful house in Scotland, which the Prince of Wales restored uh, with his own capital um, in Ayrshire, um, Dumfries House is a venue for um, young people to learn skills. Um, and the Prince of Wales is very keen that people do learn skills and people um, are coming back into traditional industries. So that's part of the story. The main thrust of the story is that we want to talk about how the industry is committed to environmental excellence, basically. And environment, by environmental excellence, I mean animal welfare, um, exploiting and promoting the sustainable biodegradable properties of wool, and indeed trying to convince consumers uh, via um, a whole series of blogs and um, social media that will be present at the event in Dumfries House that wool is a natural choice. Wool is uh, an environmentally friendly choice. Um, and there will be several keynote speakers, not to mention the, the new CEO of Marks and Spencers, um, uh, Sir Paul Smith, um, Paolo Zenia, very much the, the grandees of, of the wool trade. And in fact, Steve Rowe, the new CEO of Marks and Spencer, is actually making his maiden speech there. He took over, um, he took over earlier this year from Mark Boland, and uh, he's gone on record as saying that he wants to see Marks and Spencer become more environmentally friendly. Of course, there will be uh, the gentleman at Marks and Spencer who put in Marks and Spencer's Plan A. He, he will be there as well. And the Prince of Wales wants to underline this as being an important statement uh, in UK um, for a more environmentally friendly fashion scene, less fast fashion, more investment uh, in wool with a better return with a better return on capital. Okay, yeah, we'll ma I think this episode will air after the event has happened, and we oh, will okay. make sure to link to the websites of the campaign for wool, so that anyone listening today can actually go and find out more about the event. And what do you recommend to companies working in wool, um, as well as retailers? How can they join the campaign? How can they become a part of that? I think the flow is quite easy. The, the growers are part of the campaign. The top makers are, the spinners are, the weavers are. The retailers are slowly but surely, over the last six years, have come into the campaign. It's a story which is somehow linked to provenance, to people wanting to talk about where their jacket or suit or trousers or knitwear came from, or indeed carpet came from. Uh, there is a, a lot of curiosity around, and I think the Campaign for Wool gives that supply chain story, which a lot of people 
are very keen, and a lot of retailers are very keen to emphasise, particularly at the upper middle and premium level. And maybe you just mentioned provenance. Can you explain that concept a little bit more? Um, because I know you've talked about it for many years already, and I think it's very important to you. So please give a little bit more detail about what you mean with provenance in regards to wool. I think in simple terms, if you look at the provenance of cheese and wine, for example, um, particularly in the UK, you can't buy a piece of cheese from a decent um, um, store uh, without someone talking about where the cheese came from, a particular farm, a particular type of milk that is used to produce the, sh uh, to produce the cheese. And of course, when you talk about wine, you talk about uh, wines from Rheinhessen, wines from Burgundy, and the whole story about the vineyards is there. Wool didn't seem to take that sort of lead many years ago. Wool was wool, all blended in. But I think that people now are talking about where does the wool come from? Um, is it Merino from New South Wales? Is it Merino from New Zealand? Is it crossbred from New Zealand? Is it from Uruguay? Is it uh, Herdwick from the hills of England? They want to know a bit more about it. And I think in some ways the retailer or the fashion house owes them this sort of DNA. They're paying premium prices, so they want to know where it all comes from. It's a growing movement, and it's to the advantage of wool. Okay, and yeah, I, I think you're right with that. And also, nowadays, with the technologies that are available, including Absolutely. the internet, it makes it even easier for people, on one hand, to trace where things are coming from and just to find out more about their products. So. I mean, I think that's a quite a to, 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 to emphasize the point, we do have the stories, but for uh, many years we haven't told them. Mm. Um, and as, I mean, I remember when I was much younger, wool was about 8-9% of total fiber consumption in apparel. Sadly, now it's gone down to 1.2, 1.3. So it's, uh, it's a luxury fiber. And when you're in a luxury area, more questions are asked. When you're in the cheap area, people don't ask questions at all. <laughs> in fact, people try to deny where it comes from rather than emphasize where it comes from. But in our trade at, at the moment, The premium end of Bond Street, Savile Row, the Koenig's Alley in Dusseldorf, those premium areas of shopping. There are lots of questions being asked. Why am I paying a thousand euros for this? What is its provenance? Where does it come from? Um, am I buying something which is of value? And the other question is people ask, um, am I making for, am I, for this amount of money I spend, am I making a, a contribution to the environment rather than damaging the environment? And of course, wool is a contribution. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and well, yeah, just to add on that, also, I guess the today's media and social media are so content hungry, and that's even the big opportunity to tell these stories that we have readily available. We just Absolutely. need to get it's them out there. An, an, an ideal opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone's connected, and everyone's asking questions. <laughs> Yes. Another topic that I wanted to touch upon with you is that you also had the honor of being a judge at the Woolmark Prize, where young designers develop collections with Marina Wool and compete on regional and international level to win the Woolmark Prize. And one of the first designers to win this, this prize were actually Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Saint Laurent. Um, where do you see the benefit of such design competitions for the wool industry? I think it's immensely important that the Woolmark Prize Uh, seeks to showcase and to spotlight, uh, put the spotlight on on, on on emerging talent. I think there's lots of talent coming out of the colleges and universities throughout the world, particularly particularly here 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 where I am now in the, in in the UK, that needs that extra push, that extra help, to put them into the international spotlight. The Walmart Prize does just that, and if I can quote couple of journalists that were at the International Walmart Prize Men's in Florence in January, they said that the talent that had been highlighted at that event, not just the winners, but the but all the, all the participants, um, it was immensely helpful to them and to the and to and to the message of wool that these young emerging uh, talents were brought to the forefront of the fashion scene. And to do that during Pitti Maggiore Uomo, for example, is a massively wonderful opportunity for young talent to be showcased. Um, we do it during fashion weeks, deliberately. Um, the next menswear one will be in London, during London Collections Men. Uh, the women's wear one will be in Paris. Um, so it is showcasing wool in young talent at a time when the world focus is on fashion. 
And when you talk to these uh, young designers, what is it that fascinates them with wool once they get to know it and work with it? I think if you talk about the natural, sustainable, biodegradable message that the fiber that they're using is actually making a contribution to the environment, uh, then that gives a certain added value to their collections. And if you tell them that when the wool, when the long life of their collections or, or <laughs> garments in their collection, when, uh, when it comes to an end, the end of life story is environmentally friendly. Um, it's very interesting to tell. Well, I enjoyed telling one of the well, two of the designers actually in Florence that wool, when it's buried in the ground, doesn't linger in landfill at all like polyester, like cotton. It actually biodegrades, and that biodegradability actually enriches the soil. And they were fascinated. And I and think. It's a true story. And yeah, I think you had an event around that with His Royal Highness Prince of Wales in his we garden. did. <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in Prince Charles's garden in Clarence House in London, we buried a wool sweater and we buried a polyester, sorry, a, a, an acrylic sweater. Well, after six months, the wool sweater had almost biodegraded. The polyester sweater was perfectly intact and just needed shaking off and putting back on the racks in the cheap store from where it came. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that story, and I think it was a great demonstration to have. Um, and also coming back to the designers, I know that you're also often at trade fairs, and you travel all around the world to, attra to attend different trade fairs. And what recommendation would you give to brands and designers who want to start working with wool? Which are the fairs that they should be looking out for? There are three principal fairs in the fashion business. I think the one fair that invests most in fashion information is Premier Vision in Paris, which is every which is every September and every February. There are over 750 exhibitors there, which I think about 200 and odd will be featuring wool collections both in winter and in spring summer. Um, so I would start there, and I'd look to Milano Unica in Milan, where there is a large Italian and foreign or many European offer of wool. Um, the other area to look for wool is, I think, quite honestly, to look at the trend sections of Premier Vision and see what the designers who run the Premier Vision fashion forecasting system have highlighted for the season. Have a look at that, and then I'd be very tempted to come to the Woolmark stand and look at the Wool Lab. The Walmart company have invested heavily in, in the Wool Lab. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a trend forecasting document in, in which there are six or seven areas um, that highlight fabrics for the season. It's um, a work that is sourced from weavers who are part of Walmart's licensing scheme. Um, and they, particularly uh, for winter, they weave specialities which will feature wool sometimes in very unknown areas. One of the unknown areas which is emerging as being very important is, is active sportswear. Um, to wear wool um, when climbing a mountain or wear running or wear rowing or wear uh, playing tennis is really quite advantageous. It doesn't, it's odor resistant, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, thermal, it's thermal management friendly. Uh, when it's cool, you're cool, uh, you're warm. When it's warm, you're cool. So those areas are very important. It's an area which we are developing very much at the Walmart company at the moment. Yeah, and I agree. The Wool Lab is really a wonderful tool for everyone to get inspired and to really learn more about the different properties of that wool fabric, depending on how it is wo uh, woven or knitted, can have for the clothing that one wants to establish. So yeah, I will also um, link to that when we get this episode out. And um, I know that also we've started in the beginning talking of Baghdad, and which is a hotter climate country. And I know that today you're also promoting um, wool to be worn in hot climate countries, such as, for example, Dubai. Can you tell a little, us a little bit about that campaign? Cool Wool was a campaign of the 80s, 1980s, which um, fizzled out. It didn't, it didn't continue. And um, Four years ago, um, Stuart McCulloch and I were at Premier Vision in spring, and we were looking at all the fabrics that were available on the spring collections at the February show. We thought, hmm, why don't we relaunch Cool Wool? It was probably one of the uh, greatest things that Woolmark ever did, and it got 
traction throughout the world. In fact, the Italians still talk about Lana Fresca, uh, which is um, which was uh, very popular amongst the Italian brands in the 1980s. So we looked at the specification for Kubo. We looked at the the ecological claims. We looked at the thermal management claims of cool wool, and we and we and we relaunched it, and it's doing rather well. It's uh, one of our flagship campaigns in, in India, for example, um, where Indians in certainly in Maharashtra, Bombay, Mumbai want to be smart. Um, office workers, uh, bankers, uh, people looking in the in the Indus, in the Indian service economy. Uh, it's been particularly popular there. Um, also in Asia, um, where dress codes are still intact, Japan, Hong Kong, parts of China. It's all part of a program that I like to talk about, is wool for all seasons. You can, in fact, have wool in spring, wool in summer, wool in autumn, and wool in winter. Uh, it's uh, it's because of, basically because of its breathability. I like to illustrate this with a couple of photographs of paintings that I've discovered in galleries around the world. One is in uh, New South Wales by a guy called Tom Roberts who talks, who, who, who painted a picture called A Breakaway, and it's merino sheep escaping in searing heat of around 40-odd degrees in the Australian outback. The other one is by George Fercarson, an Edinburgh-based artist who paints several pictures of sheep coming home in the winter. And there's one called The Homecoming, and it's sheep in half a meter of snow being guided in by their shepherd, uh, but both are equally happy in minus 10, minus 15 centigrade, and plus 40. Tom Roberts and George Fercarson. <laughs> and that is the same for humans wearing wool in winter. Yep, and the same summer. for humans wearing wool. Okay, wonderful. I love that um, analogy. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, before we close, how can people find out more about your work? Would that be via the woolmark.com website? And I the think campaign either for via iwto.org or mm -hmm. www.wool.com. Um, um, talk to me directly uh, via iwto.org. Okay, great. We'll link to those um, websites on the show notes. And thank you so much, Peter. I know you're very busy and I wish you much success with the Davos of Wool in, in September and I wish you a good day. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure, Lisa. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. <laughs> good day. Bye-bye. We hope you found this interview with Peter Ackroyd interesting. If you want to find out more about Peter, look at the show notes by visiting elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 004. Once again, elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 004. If you liked today's show, may we recommend that you subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss any of our next episodes and also do us a favor and tell your colleagues and friends about us. That would mean the world to us and thank you and see you next week. Bye-bye.